Good morning, Cabo Community Church. Hello, Dan. Nice to see you back there. Back from the Great North. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, today we're going to start the service with Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. It's kind of an upbeat song. We like to start church with a little happiness and, uh, and a little bit of jiggling of the camera. Hello, YouTube. <laughs> if you'd all please stand. Some of you are going to have to sit down. We're just going to be here. Here we go. One. But the Bible study, Wednesday morning, is uh, starting at 8 o'clock, okay? Wednesday morning, 8 o'clock, um, which means with this fall week, whatever time change thing, I give you two extra hours to get there, all right? <laughs> so we're trying to make that uh, spring forward fall back. Fall back, if you got it. Anyway, good to see you all here. How many came an hour early? Jeff, where's Jeff? <laughs> Yeah, he, he, called, he, he, was, he, he texted me about 6 in the morning and said he was at the church already, so <laughs> he does come early regardless, anyway. So we've got, we've got uh, that news coming up. Um, there's something I, I want to say just, just briefly. Um, well, actually, before one other thing, of course, um, Samaritan's Purse. If you haven't got your box, you haven't done that yet, please uh, pray about doing that in a big way. That is such a great outreach. It just really does impact the world for Christ for sure. All right. Well, one of the things that Christians like to do is confess. So I'm going to confess a couple things. And it's actually springboarding off of uh, the women's event yesterday. I was reminded about pastoring and fellowship and love. And the whole idea is, uh, you know, that primarily we're our brother keeper. We are our brother's keeper. <laughs> You know, came to say, oh, what am I, my brother's keeper? Well, we kind of are. And I think as we go through this time of doing a pastor search, your elder board, uh, the, their deficits are kind of showing up as, 
as giftings that, gee, we wish we had in stronger spades, but many of you in the body have a pastor's heart. You have a desire for fellowship and loving one, one another. So love one another. Love one another. I want to encourage each other, you know, think about someone in the body here that, that maybe you haven't seen in church for a while, or you know they're down or depressed over something. Reach out to them and, and give them and pastor them. The other, the other shortcoming, uh, I would just encourage you to seek and ask questions. I would say your elder board is a little weak in administration right now. So pastoring and administration, we're not perfect at that. We're not perfect at anything. We're just doing our best, and our best isn't good enough. So rely on each other during this time as we wait, wait for a new pastor. Does that make sense? Anybody have a problem with that? Y'all good? That's my. That's our confession. Your, your, your elders love you. We're, we're doing our best. We have other obligations, things going on. I apologize. We're not we're not hitting all the notes, but uh, but contact us. Ask us what's going on. Encourage us. It's it's been a long time. We've been searching for a pastor, and that pastor will probably show up with hopefully stronger administration skills and pastoring skills than the current elders you have on board. That makes sense. You good with that, Leonard? Yes. I didn't throw you off the bus and run you over yet. No. Uh, <laughs> all I, I would just add that uh, we are just willing men to accept this responsibility. There you go. That's 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 who we are. Anyway, with that said, let's pray for this service, shall we? Heavenly Father, Lord God, I just thank you and praise you, Lord God, that uh, you are in charge of this church, Lord God, and uh, we do seek to be. Uh, your followers, Lord God, and, and to be one family, to love one another, Lord God. So help us, Lord God, with that task of just, just loving one another, and sharing each other's burdens, and, and reaching out to one another, Lord God, as we go through this pastor search. And that's irrelevant in all reality, Lord God, that we just we just disregarding whether we have a, a senior pastor or not. We're to, to share each other's burdens, Lord God. So I pray, Lord God, that we are drawn close together during this time, and we persevere, Lord God, and, uh, and stay steadfast and true, Lord God, to, to uh, encourage one another to be more and more Christ-like. In your precious Son, Jesus' name we pray, we lift up this worship, Lord God, and may give you glory. In, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 I didn't have words. I was just like, what is, 
what is this? Where did this come from? Is reality here? People, is you guys are doing this for real? And they said, yes. I said, I received one when I was there. And everybody was so happy. Everybody was looking at me like, yes, you are in our church. Seeing God connecting me being 14 and coming to the United States and to see the two elements just connected as a perfect picture, showed me that I'm in the right spot. I'm in the right place serving the world. Daniel is my son. Daniel is the version of anywhere in Senegal, but in the United States. Talking to him is the opportunity like my dad told me. No matter what you struggle with, remember, you have a God that loves you. Daniel packed box, and he liked to say also his dad received one. In the corner of this universe, you have a kid that is waiting for you to pack a box for them. It's not just a shoe box that you are packing. You are changing lives. All I can say is wow. There's no small effort on our part to reach those kids for Jesus. Which brings me to my next point. Saturday is my favorite day of the year. It's our packing party. And I hope all of you will come and pack boxes for, kid, for people like Edward. Um, I couldn't ask about the $10 suggested shipping. What a bang for your buck. You not only get the box from here to Orange County, from Orange County to wherever in the world that they're going, but the kids also receive the greatest gift which comes with their shoe boxes, and it tells the story of salvation. It also teaches the, the nationals in the, the receiving country, the teachers, how to teach, and prepares them for the recipients of the, of the kids. So how can you, I mean, you can't get a Happy Meal, I don't think, at McDonald's anymore. Um, but $10, it's well worth it. Um, so, come Saturday. It's, my, it's Christmas for me. Yes, Larry. What time? One thirty, right here in the Belcher Hall. Thank you so much. We were reading a uh, a book last night at my house. Um, Kaylee was reading to us about the Modalone tribe, which was reached by a young man who was a very ambitious missionary, and um, and in that tribe, they. They, all the families lived together, and yet they had, it was only a family uh, that cared about the same family. So if there was extra food, they would throw it out rather than give it to someone else. And this kind of thing is, is um, all over the world, there's a lot of people who don't really see any kind of caring. And in this country, we have a lot of people who care. And a lot of times people who receive gifts are very are very jaded and they go and they go oh you know oh thanks thanks for the little gift or whatever that's fine and then they just look past it but in a lot of these other countries it means the world so please pack a shoe box thank you very much please stand up we're, we're gonna sing I will rise
this is the time uh, in our worship that we uh, thank God for, for the offering and his provision. Uh, out the double doors there on the windowsill, there is a basket to put your offering in. Uh, we foregone the uh, passing the, the plate around, and God has blessed us. And, and uh, the only thing I pray for is, is that you remember when you leave <laughs> to go ahead and, and, and make an offering and stuff. So that's kind of the idea. One of the things that's really real encouraging, I think we need to take away from Scripture, Jesus said it's better to give than receive. And that is so true. We talk about the, the Samaritan first boxes. We talk about providing for others and giving. It's, it's one of the secrets of joy is that, that we're called to give. Um, we have it backwards, humanity. We're grabbing things externally and trying to put it in our heart and trying to appease our, our emotions and our intellect. We're, we're doing this with everything, not necessarily just money, but so many things we grab and we try to apply to ourselves. And self-medicate, I think is the term, you know, whether that be a drug or whether it be TV or money or an activity, a hobby, and, and you know, something other than seeking God and becoming more Christ-like. So don't fall into that ditch, church. Try to, try to understand and believe wholeheartedly that what the Bible says and what Jesus proclaims it is better to give than receive. And so when we give in all sorts of lawful facets, not necessarily money alone, but our time and our, our charity and our, our counsel and our encouragement, our hugs, as we do that, I assure you, you will be joyful far more than than uh, than trying to self-medicate with whatever idol you grab to put inside yourself to make yourself uh, cope better. So, so think about that in this time as we as we say a, a prayer for, for God's provision. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you and praise you, Lord God, for your provision in this church, Lord God, as we persevere on day by day, week by week, month by month, as we go forward, Lord God to proclaim your goodness and be a light on the hill, Lord God, to this community, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to take away the principle of giving, uh, not only in regards to our offering, but in other aspects of our life, Lord God. Help us to understand what you say is better to give than receive, Lord God, and to live that out and, and actually experience it, the joy and beautiful feeling that, that is given back to us and the, the, the peace and joy, Lord God, which is just such a subtle aspect of our life, but it but it brings forth contentment, Lord God. We, we ask this prayer not as some kind of a therapeutic way to make ourselves be better. We, we want, Lord God, to believe it and obey it because it is true, Lord God. And the byproduct we know is, uh, is better, as Jesus said. So we just, we just thank you for that, Lord God. Help us to get our, our priority right in that regard. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 So I, I love the worship. Worship team was awesome. Yes. Really, really good job. Good job. Uh, I did discover a new critic in the, in the in the body right here. Baby Theo discovered his ears and was doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we we do have a, a challenge. You have to overcome his uh, his critique. But we'll get it. We'll it, get was, it. it looked very condemning in, in that regard. So, Those are new ears. Those yeah. are new ears. Yeah, yeah. they're not yeah. just new ears. But uh, with that said, uh, teachers, do you want to be uh, excused before Lord's Supper or after? What's that? Right now? All right. So with that said, our new critic will be going off to learn uh, why we should appreciate that music in, uh, in uh, the children's studies. All right? Heavenly Father, Lord God, I just ask you, uh, bless the teachers and the children, Lord God, as they go off to learn. Uh, from you, Lord God, and I pray, Lord God, that uh, Theos opens up his ears and his mind to what he'll be hearing in the class today. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. 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 All right. It's time for the Lord's Supper. Um, it is a, a sacrament. It's one of the few Christian things that we do repetitively. And the first question is, why do we do it? Does it save us? No. Does it have any salvation value? No, of course no. not. The scripture it clearly says this um, that we do this in remembrance, right? In uh, it, it, just, uh, let me pick it up in five. Let me, like, let me I'll go through it in proper order. Picking up in verse twenty-three, uh, First Corinthians eleven twenty-three. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that 
the Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me it's something we do in remembrance and once again we're in our Bible study this morning the Apostle Paul is, is playing the card here and making it very clear that he received this instruction firsthand from the Lord. You know, after his conversion, that primarily he is in, he's being discipled by the Lord directly because he didn't run off and go to the seminary. He didn't get this information the other way. So as he shares this, and we do this in remembrance, it's key that we need to understand that this is the truth behind this sacrament that we partake in that at this time you can you can get quiet and pray about where you've been and where you are now we're basically in a born again <coughs> experience there should be some stuff we desire to do that oppose god and is clearly a sin but as we embrace god and walk and we invite the, the holy spirit to dwell upon us the stuff we used to love to do we now hate and the righteousness that God calls us to do, we now love. So there's this paradigm shift. And that's what the cross accomplished. So let's just take a moment to remember the before and after of, of, our, of our life. Often when I reflect like that, lyrics from Amazing Grace, a wretch like me come to mind. But we're no longer there. The little uh, plastic doohinky. Grab that. <laughs> very processed, but very uh, hygienic. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Because I feel one to me. I know it better. I totally know better. There we go. Jesus took this, took the bread and said, My body is broken for you. Eat and recall of God. Recall body. Recall church. What he's done for us. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this talk to me as often as you drink in remembrance of me. You know what I did last time? I'd love to do it again. Just give everybody a couple minutes, just to say hi to one another, uh, especially if there's someone that you don't recognize and you know they're uh, someone you don't know. I'm really encourage you to 
go say hi. Um, so um, I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes here just to greet one another and uh, welcome one another. Now the work starts. Did you didn't get a uh, few notes? Make sure you uh, have some notes there for today's message. But uh, yeah, we're going to get into that here. Bob, I feel like you kind of cramped me over here. I can't like move around. You know? oh, you're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Oh, are you saying? Oh, man. <laughs> I didn't realize that was going to happen. Ask and you shall receive. Right. You must have read Just already what we were talking about. <laughs> Oh, that's good. That's good. Sweet. All right. Great. Well, uh, especially if you're visiting, uh, if you're new here, thanks for coming. And we're, we're glad you're here. So, um, thanks for. I felt like I was a little hot there. So, thanks for turning that down. That's so cool. But uh, let's let's pray. Let's ask God to teach us this morning and uh, be our guide. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. That your mercy is new every morning. And God, you are, you are merciful. And so as we get to gather together and we get to see one another, we get to check in, uh, there's something good that's happening here with us being here, uh, part of your design. And uh, in that design, we, we wanted to honor you, uh, but we also, we know that there are so many things that can distract us that are probably already on the mind, thinking about later today, um, things that have happened this past week, maybe relationships that are uh, a stress on us right now, um, things, maybe big, big things on the horizon that we're anticipating that um, are causing us not just to be anxious, but just to occupy our minds. And so, God, I want to ask that your spirit right now would help us to be present, to listen to you, to your voice, to be attentive to your word. God, that you would use this time to teach us, to reveal in us the things that we need to see about our own heart, our mind, and our lives that we need to adjust and reshape so that it's an honor to you. Thanks for this time together. I need to speak through me. It's in your good name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So, uh, yeah, like I said, glad to be here and uh, looking forward to our message today. Just so you guys know the, the title, I like, threw together the last minute, staying connected in the chaos. I don't even know if that's going to be helpful for you, so don't even worry about the title, all right? Uh, but we're going to be looking at John 15. So, first of all, I just... Um, John 15 is, is known because it talks about fruit. Uh, how many of you guys like fruit? Okay, good. Most of you like fruit. How about fresh fruit? Yeah, some fresh fruit? Yeah, yeah. In Tahoe, you know, we don't get to experience, like, the freshest of fresh fruits, right? Um, but have you ever ate a peach that's just, like, right off the tree that's ripe? I don't know if there's anything better than that, fruit-wise. That's pretty amazing. The juiciness... The sweetness of it, um, so good. Um, or what about like an apricot? I know apricots are like kind of like hit and miss with people. Not everybody likes them, but I'm sure most of you have probably had like a bad apricot, right? Where it's kind of like dry and like pithy or like uh, chalky, right? And it kind of makes you not want one for a while. But like a good apricot, where it's like just slightly sweet, right, and just slightly juicy. Um, and it just leaves you wanting more, right? Um, one of my favorite fruits is persimmon, which is probably a weird one. Most of you, anybody know what persimmon is? Yeah, a couple? All right, yeah, good, good, good. A couple in the back, we really like them. Yeah. They have them at Costco right now. Oh, hey, there's a heads up. There's a tip for everybody. Yeah, after the service, go down and go get some. Uh, so I, I spent some time down in, down in Chico. I have a good friend down there from college. And uh, in his front yard, he has this persimmon tree. This persimmon tree has definitely been there for a while. It's probably part of the reason why he bought the house, because this persimmon tree has the best persimmons that I've ever had. Seriously, they're big, they don't have seeds in them, they are amazing. And so, um, since I've spent enough time visiting him and, and being there for extended times, I've been able to see this tree in different seasons of its life. 
Um, and so in the winter time, it's not much to look at. But come spring and summer, it is just, not only are the leaves full, but it is full of persimmons. And one of the times I was there, I saw them having to pick a lot of the persimmons off. And they weren't ripe yet. Um, and I was, I was kind of devastated because I'd already enjoyed the fruits of it. And I knew, like, these are amazing. And so he's throwing away all, probably half of the persimmons that were on the tree. And I was like, are you kidding me? Why are you doing that? And he's telling me, if I don't do it, I have the, the branches are going to break because they're way too heavy from the persimmons. And then what you enjoy is also, it's not going to be good because it's, it's going to be kind of like divvied out amongst all the fruit, right? So I was like, okay, it makes sense. Come September, uh, kind of one by one, the persimmons start to ripen up uh, and you can start eating them. And they're, like I said, they're amazing. Come October, though, he has so many that he can't eat them all. And so he has to give them, he's just, he's giving them away, which I wish I lived closer so that I could have more. But um, as soon as it starts to rain, which, what, is like November now, and this is kind of the time of year we start to get to these rains and down there. And so the leaves fall off pretty quickly, the wind blows them off, um, and all the fruit's gone now, too, especially the birds that have eaten them. Um, there's, there's no more fruit on the tree, and it's back, it's back to looking pretty dismal. Um, but this is also the time when he starts to prune the tree. And so uh, every time he prunes it, I, I just, I want to stop him. I want to tell him, don't, don't do anything else to the tree. The tree is already good. <laughs> um, but I also know um, that deep down, it's what's best for the tree. Um, if he doesn't, the branches will continue to break. Um, and not only will the branches continue to break, but then some of the branches that are been there a long time and have been kind of really tended to, those will break off, and so you'll lose even more fruit. Um, and uh, the fruit would also never be as good as it could be if he doesn't prune it, right? And so um, you see the, the pruning is essential for the health of the tree, so that the tree would bear fruit and bear the best persimmons ever. I hope you guys get to try it one day. So, um, but we are just like that. We're just like this in the sense that remaining connected to Jesus will produce fruit in our lives. And the more connected we remain, the more ripe we become. So today we're looking at John 15, and um, I have that printed for you in your notes. And we're just going to look at the first 11 verses. Uh, and so this this little section here is kind of sandwiched between uh, a couple chapters here, uh, 14 and 16, and these, this section is typically called the Farewell Address, Jesus' Farewell Address. Uh, it's, it's one of, I think in the New Testament, out of the, the four different accounts that we have of Jesus, Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's three kind of segments that you actually have of just straight teaching from Jesus. There's not a lot of dialogue. Um, there's not a lot of added interpretation or traveling. There's just this, this straight teaching from Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount is one of those. Um, the Olive Discourse is another one that you can find in Matthew. Um, I think it's Matthew 24. Um, I might be wrong on that one. And then there's this, which is Jesus' farewell address. And I think what's, what's unique and specific about this one is that this is specifically to the disciples in a very intimate setting. It takes place in an upper room, which was uh, typically a room that was built on the roof of houses. And it was meant to be a place to host guests uh, or possibly a place to, to spend time praying. And so uh, Jesus, as you can see in, in Mark and Luke, they actually record him asking and having his disciples go and get this room prepared. And uh, they actually take the Lord's Supper up there. Um, so I'm actually, it's kind of a cool connection today of, of us getting to do that together. That's that's where Jesus started that and, and initiated that um, symbolic act of doing the Lord's Supper together. And so this upper room is, is really not only special because of what's happening, they're having their Passover meal together, um, which, was, which was huge for the Jewish people. Uh, they journeyed together to do this every year. But it's also just him and the disciples, his 12 disciples, his closest group. And so there's like this very, it's like we get this snapshot into the relationship that they had that we may not get to see in other places. And that's why I think it's kind of a, a really special 
section of verses. I, I'd encourage you to read the whole thing this week in one sitting, maybe read it multiple times, and just meditate on it because of the intimacy of the relationship between Jesus and his disciples. And, and there's a lot that can be, I think, gained from that. So, like I said, the teaching begins in that upper room. Um, and uh, at the end of chapter 14, uh, maybe, uh, Justin, can you read like the last verse of chapter 14? But he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Come now, let us leave. So, there's some speculation um, as to what this means. Is he, is he talking kind of uh, metaphorically, speaking spiritually, that like, hey, um, the, be prepared, get ready now for what is to come? Um, or is it like, literally, they're, they're leaving the upper room now. Uh, it is night, and, and also what has happened in, in chapter 14 is Judas, um, one of the 12 there, has, has left already now too. So it's just the 11. It's, um, it's, it's uh, at night, and so I wanted to show you guys a map here uh, that I think is helpful. So. I'll try and point it out so you guys can see it here on, on, the, on the right. But essentially, they're, they're kind of, they think that the upper room was over here. This is Jerusalem, like it shows the temple being over here. And uh, the, the place they're staying, it says it's right here. Some maps have said that it's kind of more this area, but the majority of them kind of I saw right here. And where they're going to be headed after this in John 18 is the Garden of Gethsemane. And so just so you have a picture of where that's at, Garden of Gethsemane is over here, and this is the Mount of Olives. And so um, they have to cross, you know, most likely a good part of the city. Maybe they go by the temple, maybe not. they got to go through the Kidron Valley to get over towards the garden. And so the reason I bring that up is because um, Jesus here is talking about a vine. He's talking about grapes. Is he at some point next to a vineyard or next to grapes? I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't say. There was, um, in something that's called the, I think it's called the, I think it's called the Mishnah, um, but the, uh, the Jewish people, uh, and, and what was recorded was that by the temple at this time, so up here, something they easily could have walked by, um, right by the temple doors, there was this golden grapevine, um, and so it was very symbolic to the people of Israel. Did he go by that? Possibly. All I know is that what he's doing is very, very intentional with this imagery about the vine and the branches, as we're gonna see here in a minute. And so, I just wanna quickly flash forward before we read this, um, because John gives us this clue again to his audience that what I am writing to you is not just important, but there's a purpose in it. And what he says there is, um, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. He didn't record everything. But these are written, what I've included is written, so that you, my audience, the Jewish people, you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so this intent... By John, again, I, it, it's always helpful for me to come back to this because I forget, uh, but like John has a very specific intent in what he's doing here. And he wants his, the Jewish people to see that Jesus is not just this great teacher, not just this prophet, um, but he is the promised one who was to come. He is the Messiah. Um, and that who John has come to know him as is what he hopes the Jewish people will come to know him as. And that's the argument that he's trying to make, I think, here as well in John 15. So let's, let's read this together. John 15, 1-11. If you have a Bible, open it up too, because I'm, I'm actually going to be asking some questions here. I'm going to need some feedback from you guys. So, um, here we go. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. I want to start with just that right now, because this, this really kind of kicks us off with a pretty heavy statement. I am the true vine. And so John, one of the things that John has intentionally done is he's made these seven I am statements uh, throughout his book. 
and each one of them is really to reference back to the story of Israel and their history and their relationship with God to say, Jesus is connected to you in this way. Um, I am, in Greek, is ego me, and so that is the exact words that um, God uses to reveal himself to Moses in the burning bush, where Moses asks, who are you? Who do I say to the people that you are? And he says, I am who I am, um, and it's, he's essentially, that's his identification for his name. And so Jesus here says, I am, and each time it's in relation to something specific, and and in this time we have, he is the true vine. So why is that, why is that important? Well, um, the, uh, the Life Application Bible Commentary, I think, summed this up better than anywhere I could find this week. And they said, the prophets had written of Israel as God's vine. So, so there's this connection of the vineyard, that God's people, Israel, saw themselves as, as the vine. Grapes were intricate to, obviously, the Lord's Supper, but also to who they were as a people. And so, um, carefully planted and cared for by him. But the vine was a disappointment because it yielded only rotten fruit. That is, they refused to give him love and obedience. And uh, where you can see this most clearly, you can write this down in your notes and reference it later if you want to go read it. But Psalm 80 and Isaiah 5 are two places that really help you understand this picture of uh, Israel as God's vine and the disappointment of it not bearing fruit. The way that God desires for it to. And so, what is, what's this connection? Well, all of a sudden here we have Jesus saying, I am the true vine. I am the fulfillment of those prophecies. I am the fulfillment of God's plan for his people. And, and I think that's pretty important in just recognizing at first that he is um, identifying himself here for that purpose. And so it goes on, he says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. All right, so that, um, that last line there is kind of funny. It seems out of place. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. But I want to point out a couple things here that's kind of helpful in the Greek. We don't really see it, but prunes and clean here. Um, are actually very similar words. Their, their Greek root is the same, so that's the uh, Greek word for prunes. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. I don't speak Greek, so, um, but if you just, you can just see the similarity in the two words. Um, and I think that's helpful for us, because in English, obviously, we don't get it, but um, that word for pruning is a sense of, like, also cleaning of the vines, um, or of the tree, right? Um, there's a sense of it being cleansed. And the other thing that's interesting here is that I think what's happening with, with prunes and cleanses, uh, specifically, he's, he's talking to his disciples. And remember, the one who, who you could almost say um, was not being pruned had left. He had, he, had, he had just left before this. The 11 that are there are the ones that are going to remain faithful. And so there's a sense of him saying, my word has already taken work in your heart, in your life. It has already begun its pruning process in you. There's evidence of that. Uh, and, and I think when you think about the life of the disciples, we know kind of moving forward, Peter's going to make a bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of mishaps um, in the next few days here. And, uh, and we know, even from just before this, chapter 14, Thomas is still wrestling with, hey, who are you, Jesus? And asking very honest questions to Jesus. Um, and so it's not that they're, they're perfect by any, men, by any means, but that they are already wrestling with, what, what's the implication for continuing to follow you as, as our Messiah, as the King, as Lord? And, and so I think there's, that's really clear. Uh, and I think it's also important to recognize, again, we don't get this in English, but prunes there is actually in the verb tense of uh, active, ongoing. So it's one of those verbs where Jesus is saying, this is something that is happening and will continue to happen. It's not like it's a, a process that happened and it's done. You no longer have that. You were pruned once and you're done. He's saying this pruning is going to be something that is ongoing repetitious, continually happening in your life. And I think that's, 
That's a powerful picture for us of thinking about what that, what that looks like for us. Now, I want you, if you have a pen in your hand here, this is going to be useful for these next uh, verses here. So we'll pick this back up in, in verse 4. I want you to underline or circle in your Bible or on the notes, whatever you prefer, every time the word remain is used here. Verse 4, remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. One thing I just wanted to stop and, I think, talk about a little bit here is just this line, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. If we think about John 14, 15, 16, all being together with one thing that Jesus is talking about, this line is actually something he repeats a few times. So in John 14, in John 14, verses 13 to 14, he says, um, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. I mean, very, very similar in what he's saying here. I think in John 16, he says, he kind of repeats it one more time. Why, why would he go at such lengths to make an issue of this? I didn't get a lot of insight, but I think one thing that's helpful to think about is he's redefining the relationship between what um, it looks like to be God's people. And part of that redefinition is, uh, I think there was maybe a little bit of an apprehension from the disciples to ask Jesus all their questions. They do, but I think there's, there's apprehension there. And I think part of that is because Messiah... And who they were coming to see who Jesus is as a rabbi, as a teacher, is that his, his time was valuable. And so they didn't want to just burden him with unnecessary things. Uh, but there was also a respect of who he was. And so maybe there was a sense of, I don't, I don't need to ask these questions. Uh, it made me think about like a king and a servant relationship. Uh, maybe a, a good example would be from the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was, anybody remember Nehemiah and what his title was? He is a cupbearer, yeah. yeah. And as a cupbearer, um, how much weight did he have with the king? Well, he didn't, he, he did, he tested it, but for him, he, he tested like the wine to make sure that it wasn't poisonous, right? Um, so that the king wasn't, you know, poisoned at all. But one, one of the things is, is that he, um, he had this burden on his heart to go back to his homeland and fix the wall of Jerusalem. Um, and he, he has a lot of uh, trepidation to ask the king for the opportunity to go do that. He doesn't take that lightly. And I think that's when we think about like a slave and a king or a servant and a king. A servant's not going to ask a lot of a king because that's not their role. Their role is to serve the king. And I think what Jesus is trying to do here is to say, I am a king, but I'm a king un unlike any other king, where I give you the personal invitation to come and ask me for because I care for you. And I think that's a real neat picture into the relationship between Jesus and his disciples. Now I would say this, for them, that probably pushed them in this direction to say, well, we can ask the king more. I think maybe we've gone this way, or we've taken advantage of it, um, and maybe we ask too much. Um, because I think maybe we have, a, we, we almost think when we read this, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Sweet, God's a genie. He gives me exactly what I want. Ask him for it, and he gives it to me. And that's just not the way that God works. Thankfully, we don't know all the ways that he works and how he answers our prayers. Uh, that's, that's a good relief. But I, there is a sense of when we ask him, know who we're asking. Know about that intimate relationship and that he wants to know from us. He wants to hear from us. Uh, but he also is king. He's, he's the rightful king. So 
Uh, moving on here into verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. <clears throat> Okay, so pop quiz here. I asked you guys to underline every time it said remain. Maybe your Bible says abide, so I should have prefaced that. But um, tally them up. What, what kind of number do we have here? Yeah. Oh, man, I got, I got a variety of numbers. That, that's not good. <laughs> um, 11, I think, is probably what I, what I counted. Um, there's 11 times here that the word remain or abide is used. And uh, it probably depends a little bit on your translation. But um, I think that's, that's helpful. So, um, so, okay, why in 11 verses would Jesus use remain 11 times? That's, I don't think it's a number coincidence thing. I think it's just, why was he so intentional? Why did he emphasize remain and abide? Reiteration makes it so, more solid in your mind. Totally, totally, right? Yeah, repetition, repetition helps um, a ton here. So I, I think uh, a good example would be um, my little girl. She's uh, just over two years old. So she's just comprehending enough now that she knows how to push back, right? And so um, there's things that I ask her to do that she's not, she's not comprehending. Um, <laughs> and there's, there's times where I have to ask her again and again and again um, to help her realize what I'm doing. One of the things that I, I want her to do is I, I say, hey, you need to listen to us, or okay? So when I'm gone, you need to listen to mama. Um, you need to respect mommy, right? And, and part of that is, um, I know she doesn't listen to mommy. <laughs> I know there's consequences when that happens. But my intent in not just repeating it is because there's actually a great importance and value to her it's good for her to learn, not just to listen, but it actually is, is good for our whole family, right? And so um, I think there's also this sense of, I know that listening in the future is going to be valuable for her. And so if I help her start to recognize now how important it is to listen, my hope is that in time she'll know it's good to listen. Whether it's to me or to God, that, but it's good for me to listen. And I think Jesus, again, back to the context here of his interaction, his relationship with the disciples, he already knows what they've been experiencing, the challenges it's been for them, as well as what's coming. Like I said earlier about Peter, we know the things that are going to be coming. Again, chapter 14, that's exactly when Jesus tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Uh, and so I think what we have here um, is this... Uh, It is this, uh, it's this important point that Jesus is trying to help his disciples recognize is that you're going to struggle in remaining connected to me. It is not going to be easy for you to do this. And I'm going to tell you to remain in me over and over because not just is it going to be difficult, but I know that it's best for you if you remain in me. I know that it's actually life-giving for you if you remain in me. And so, I think that's the same for us today, right? I mean, how many of you have been in a season um, where it's been really good and you've had a rich connection to God? And then seasons where it feels dry, you feel distant. Um, you know, I, I know for myself, um, recently with some health issues that have come up, that remaining connected to Jesus has been super difficult. Sometimes it's, when it's really good, maybe we forget God. We, we don't remain close to Him. Um, but sometimes when it's bad, we're also in a frenzy trying to figure out how to fix it, how to get out of that situation that we're not focusing and remaining connected to Him. It's one of these things that I think in principle we know. Of course it's good to be connected to God. But in practical, every day, it is, it is so difficult for us to remain Closely tethered to him. There's a uh, there's a pastor in Missouri. His name is Ted Cunningham. 
Um, and he has this marriage course that my wife and I did last year um, at Sierra. And he says this that I think is really helpful for marriage, but really helpful for us too in thinking about this. He says, what was natural early on becomes intentional later on. There's a sense of, right, at the very beginning, you're excited in a marriage, right? Um, when you meet someone, you start dating someone, you go all out to like make them feel special and loved, that they feel appreciated, right? You, you plan out those dates, um, you make them so intentional. Um, and then as the years go by, that, that doesn't happen so much, right? Um, maybe all of a sudden you kind of have this, this, uh, this baggage that you're kind of holding against them of like, well, they did this to me, so I guess I don't really need to do this for them, or um, yeah, that kind of hurt, but I'll just kind of, you know, I'll let them know later. And we just become calloused and hard, and it becomes, and we have to become intentional later on um, to cultivate that relationship. And I think it's the same way here. What was natural early on in knowing Jesus and being close to him, maybe you're, you were excited that like, wow, this gift of salvation, like I've experienced God's presence in a way that is transforming, and yet now I recognize holding on to that is one of the most difficult things for me to do. I think that's exactly what, what Jesus is trying to capture here. One of the verses that, that just was came to mind this week that I think is so helpful is 2 Corinthians 4. Uh, where Paul writes, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. And he continues, he says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's just one of those things that's just helpful in recognizing that um, we do not need to lose heart in the midst of the struggle and the challenge because um, we can know that God is renewing in us every day, cultivating in us new life. So real quick, how, how do we remain? Well, I think it's best captured right here. And she writes, says, we must remain in the community that knows and loves him and celebrates him as his Lord. Uh, Bob brought up earlier about the church being a group of people that has different gifts, right? Um, that reaching out to one another, people we haven't seen in a while, people that are hurting, people that might be sick or something, that as a community, we're remaining connected is vital for one another. I think in American culture, we don't value that much. And we actually consume it and think of it as like a transaction. I go there so I can get something, and that's good for the week, and then I can go back when I need it again. And maybe that's every Sunday, or maybe that's once a month, or maybe that's a couple times a year. But the community is integral for how God designed us to function, to experience life. And so there he goes on and says, there is no such thing as a solitary Christian. We can't, quote unquote, go it alone. But we must also remain as people of prayer and worship in our own intimate, private lives. Right, so he's capturing two things here. Being connected to the community, but also being connected to the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. And I think what he says here next is really important. We must make sure to be in touch, in tune with Jesus, knowing him and being known by him. I think there's a sense that Jesus' voice, he's speaking to us all the time. But are we listening? Are the things around us so loud and distracting that we're not actually listening to God? That we're not actually being close to his voice. Now, um, one of the things that's, I think, important about remaining is that um, Jesus promises actually something in here that was helpful for me to see this week. And he promises fruit. He says, if you remain in me, you will bear fruit. It's not an accident. It's not something you can do on your own. Remaining in me, and you will bear fruit. So what's the purpose of fruit? And that's what I just want to uh, end our time together here with, is looking at just three things. Is that I think the purpose, um, the purpose of fruit is it's for you, it's for God, and it's for others. Pretty simple, um, but just I think, first of all, when you think about it's for you, it's evidence that you're connected to the vine. 
And, and what do I mean? Um, I mean that if you're connected to the real source of life, you will see that transform your life. If this is a promise from him, there's something to hold on to, to know that fruit will come. It may not come right away, but it will come. There's um, the translation of the New Living Translation says, uh, verse 11, like this. He says, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. If we're connected to the vine, we get to be filled and have the fruit that Jesus had. Well, what's, what does that fruit look like? Well, here it says right here, joy. This is, this is something that he had, right? And it's not just joy, but we get his joy. I think that's kind of a really important thing, a distinction that not all the verses um, or translation capture, but there's a sense that we don't just get like our joy, we get his joy. And what does that joy look like? Well, look at Hebrews 12, it says, um, he in the, uh, uh, for joy he um, endured the cross. I mean, talk about a radical joy that's totally unique to our culture. In the midst of incredible hardship, incredible physical pain that he's going to experience, and isolation, loneliness that was going to happen from it, his disciples and everyone leaving him, he counts it as joy. I mean, that, that for us should really challenge the way that we view not just hardship, but even, even the good things. It should challenge us to look at life through his lens. And so I think that's a big part of the fruit. The fruit is to encourage you that you are connected to the vine, that you are connected to him. The second thing, I think that's, um, yeah, so I was just going to say, I put this in your notes, is Galatians 2, Galatians 5.2, which is the list of the fruits of the Spirit, which is always helpful to recognize, um, because um, not only do we get His joy, but I think we get His love, which, again, is a radical love. To love people that are enemies, to love people that are hard to love, that, that's the kind of love I, I want to have. I don't have that love. That's the love I want to have. The people that, you know, walk into church and are smelly and didn't brush their teeth, and you look at them and you think, man, they need help, but I'm not sure if I'm the right person to talk to them. That's, that's the kind of love I want to have, to be able to go up to them and interact with them. How about um, his patience? You think about a patience that for someone like Peter, Peter who, who walks away, who questions him, who is high and low, high and low, and Jesus has this constant patience for Peter. I would love to have that patience for people in my life. A kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I would love to have more self-control, right? And if, Jesus, if, if, if we get the fruit of, of, of Jesus, it's, I think, it's helpful for us to think through, gosh, getting to enjoy his fruit, what a blessing that is. So the second thing is just, it's, it's for God. And what does that look like? Well, it says that there in, um, in verse 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. God is glorified when we produce fruit. I, I think a helpful way to think about it is, like I said there, God delights in seeing you bear fruit. And I think it's specific, actually. It says much fruit. It's not that there's a sense of, like, just... A little bit of fruit he enjoys when like our life is abundant and that he is he's honored by that he is glorified by that which I think is 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 helpful for me to recognize that that is a good direction to be focused on is what kind of fruit is, is happening in my life <clears throat> the third one is is for others I was talking to a neighbor the other day um, that I don't I don't really have a good relationship with, I don't really know them too well, and so I was, I was shocked when he remembered my name. And so we we're talking, it was actually on Halloween, and uh, uh, <clears throat> he says, oh, oh, so you work at Sierra, isn't that where so-and-so goes? Um, and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, they go there. Um, and he's like, I I'm trying to figure out like, what's his impression of the person he just mentioned. Is it a good impression, or is it a negative impression? And he goes on to talk about 
how the guy works out a lot and is really fit and really active. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Like, that was the impression that he got of this guy. You know? And, and, it, and it made me realize everybody is watching. There's a sense that when you say that you go to church, they're going to ask, maybe not overtly, but they're going to ask, what does that do for that person's life? What kind of person is that? And I, and I think that's a part of what the fruit is. The fruit is, is to be reflected towards other people. The fruit of the Spirit I just listed there, those are all things that impact other people. And the fruit here I think that's helpful is, is that you're going to influence people around you. It's helpful to think about what kind of influence are you going to have in that life. Your neighbor's lives, your family's lives, um, friends' lives, random people too. What kind of influence are you going to have? The last connection here that I think is for others is that this, this connects us to God's overarching story. So I included Genesis 12 up here because this is where God makes his covenant with Abraham. And the covenant is, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I, I, I like this connection, because when you think about the Garden of Eden, God wants Adam and Eve to, what, be fruitful and... Oh man, you guys are falling asleep, huh? Oh, yeah, be fruitful and multiply. And so, um, multiply... Um, there's a sense of sharing the good gifts that God has given you. That it's not just about procreation, about having kids, having lots of kids, right? But it's about sharing what God has given you so that others can enjoy that. Same thing here with Abraham. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. Why? So that you can be a blessing to others. That's his purpose for Israel. So that the country, the nation of Israel would be a blessing to the countries around it. That it'd be a place that they could find a refuge in, that they could, they could see that Yahweh, the one true God, was different than any other god or idol around them. In their law, there was allocations to welcome the foreigners. Like that quote earlier, Israel, you could almost say, had rotten fruit. Jesus here, um, I think, is continuing this with us to say, you have the opportunity to be a blessing to other people. You have the opportunity to let that impact the people around you. Because that's God's design from the beginning, <laughs> is that people would be blessed through you because you know and enjoy Him. Let's pray. Father, thanks. For our time together, there's a lot of other things I, I, uh, that went through my mind that I thought I could have shared, but um, yeah, you helped help me share just what I needed to today, and so um, I want to pray, God, that you um, would continue to encourage each of us this week um, with being able to examine what kind of fruit are we producing in our life, and if it's good fruit, let us be encouraged that you are alive and at work in our life. If it's unhealthy, though, I want to pray, God, that you would help us recognize what we need to do to align our hearts and our lives back to you. If we've been disconnected from you, that we would remain connected to you. That we would fight hard to not drift away, but to stay connected, to remain in you, because it's good. It's the best thing for us. God, I need that reminder. Oh
food for us next door. You guys would like to come and join us for a fellowship meal. We're going to have that right now. Thank you so much for being with us.